Hello and welcome back to the channel. First, I want to thank you all for all the comments. I do read, I think, all of them and I do appreciate them. Just please remember, I can't answer individual medical questions. I can't, that would be practicing medicine over the internet, which I'd prefer to keep my license for a little bit longer, if at all possible. So I thought I'd dedicate one episode here to one of the more common questions I've seen in the comments. And that is, what about unicompartmental knee replacements, what are called partials or unis they're sometimes referred to. And I have some pretty strong feelings about it. This is going to be basically my opinion on it. I, I, I did not do a lot of digging up recent data on it, but I have a pretty good handle on the evidence behind it. First of all, when we talk about a partial, the knee joint, we consider it to have three compartments the medial, the inside, the lateral, the outside, and the kneecap, the patellofemoral joint. When we do a total knee replacement, in theory, we're replacing the entire surface of the knees, plus or minus the kneecap. That can sometimes be replaced, other times not. Perhaps that's a good topic for another video as well. But a partial generally replaces just one compartment at a time. The most commonly done, the most studied, is the medial side, the inside part of the knee. That's what we call, them, call a medial unicompartmental knee arthroplasty or knee replacement. And the advantages of this procedure are that it is a much easier recovery. It's a smaller incision. There's far less muscle trauma, and the recovery is a lot quicker. It also feels more natural. And some of the prior videos, I've talked about how complex knee motion is, and our total knee replacements don't quite get that right. There's what we call a medial pivot. There's rollback. There's all kinds of things that happen that a total knee replacement just can't e exactly mimic. But with a partial, you retain a lot more of that normal function. The ACL remains intact. So the problem with it, though, is that typically revision rates historically have been higher than they are with a total knee replacement. And in my hands, it was about 20%. And that's not just at 15 years, but, you know, within the first few years, about one in five, I feel like I had to take back and convert to a knee replacement. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is that it's a technically challenging operation. And if I think there is any role for robots, this may be one. You're working in a very tight, confined space. And the success, particularly with Oxford, which is a mobile bearing system, meaning the plastic is not attached to the metal and it's floating around. If you do that improperly, that piece can squirt out, it can, can dislocate. And that's a disaster and, and generally needs revision surgery. So it's a technically more challenging procedure. The other reason is that we're not replacing all parts of the knee. So there are other parts of the knee that could have damage, could have arthritis, or could progress to develop arthritis that would require it to be revised to a knee replacement. Now, is doing a revision from a partial to a total knee extremely difficult? Usually not. But there is bone loss involved. And that's why the mobile bearing is attractive to a lot of people, because when the plastic moves around, then you can use a thinner plastic, and that requires less bone to be resected. Now, the fixed bearings are very popular and have very good success rates as well, but that generally requires a little bit more bone removal, and therefore the revision to a total knee replacement can be a little bit more complicated. But there's no question that the results are not the same going from a partial to a total as someone who starts immediately to a total. It's still considered revision surgery. You're dealing with scar tissue. There's going to be a little bit higher infection rate. All those things are considerations. So I hope that explains it just a little bit. I think it's still in the right hands and in the right indications, a good operation. If people want it and ask for it, I send them readily to one of my partners who still does this. But I didn't want that failure rate. And I'll point my finger at myself, the Oxford group typically says that you need to do 40 or 50 of those a year. Well, that's a lot. That's a large percentage. And, you know, one point in my career, I was doing a couple hundred knee replacements a year, and that would have been 25% of them. Now, they're, according to their training protocol, that's probably about the right percentage that are eligible for partials. And that's where there's probably a lot of debate. All right, that's enough anecdotal evidence. Time to look at some real data. We're gonna look at the Australian Joint Replacement Registry Database, one of the most robust in the world. They've been collecting joint replacement data over 25 years on their population. In the United States, we're still way behind, barely over 10 years into our registry databases. This is a gold mine of information. It's freely available. I'll leave a link in the description if you'd like to download it and look through it yourself. They even have a layman's version. But if you look at their primary total knee replacements, over 700,000 are already in this database going out as far as 23 years.
But I want you to look right here. The 15-year revision rate for a primary complete total knee replacement is under 6%. When you compare that with a partial knee replacement, that revision rate's almost 20% at 15 years. That's basically a three-fold, if not higher, difference. And this difference endures, if not worsens, over time. And the primary reason for the revisions is the progression of disease. The parts of the knee that haven't been replaced go on to progress to more advanced arthritis and ultimately need a total knee replacement. Loosening comes in behind at second, and you can see that bearing dislocation of those mobile bearing components is only about 3.8%. So that cumulative incidence of revision, we can see here graphically how much progression of disease plays a role in that. And when you have a total knee replacement, there's really nothing left to progress. It's why I do it now, and it's kind of the one and done mentality. And this worsens in younger populations. And this is generally the population that seeks out this operation. It's generally who it gets offered to the most because they want to leave more bone behind and potentially an easier revision pathway for them in the future. I think it's also important to see that over time, the fixed bearings are outperforming the mobile bearings from a revision standpoint. In this paper, we can see that the Oxford group has an explanation for these higher rates of revision, that people simply aren't doing enough of them. Their indications aren't broad enough, therefore they don't have the experience to lower that revision rate down to acceptable rates. In this study, I think outlines an important aspect that literally almost half of patients who had to have a revision from a partial knee to a primary knee had to have some kind of metal augmentation. That means there was enough bone loss that specialized revision type implants had to be utilized. So this wasn't just your regular primary knee replacement when they had to convert that partial. And finally, we have to look at the value of the robot. Unfortunately, robotics, just like we saw in the primary knee, don't seem to have any significant impact on that revision rate with a partial. Now, as surgeons, it drives us crazy when someone famous gets an operation because everyone wants to have that. And Lindsey Vaughn did have a partial knee replacement, I believe a couple of years ago. And by all counts, is back skiing and competing at a very high level and maybe even in the Olympics this year. But you can't generalize what a professional high-level athlete does compared to the rest of us. First of all, they have a very narrow window in which they need to make the most of their athletic careers, and they're less concerned about the long-term future of, the of their need. incredible knee. comebacks we have ever seen in any sport at any time. But when generalized to a regular population, most people in this study did not get back to that very high level of athletic activity they had five years before their operation. All right, so back to the guy in the blue scrubs. So that's my sort of long-winded answer to that. I do think it has a role. I think careful selection and someone who's doing a reasonable volume of it are probably the keys. Like so many other things in surgery that experience and repetition really matter. One final note, and I think particularly with the Oxford knee, I, it's obviously been over, I think, 20 years since I went through that training program. For surgeons that are out there, I think it's a really valuable learning experience because they really dive deeply into what's called balancing and the theory behind it. And I think it's a, a really helpful just training program in general, even if you don't intend to do the operation. Thanks for joining us today. I'll see you next time.